Invisible Experts podcast. Hello, Kai. Kai or Kay? Kai, right? Kay. Yes. How are you? Welcome to this podcast. Um, for us, it's an honor having you. We really appreciate the fact that you are participating in this series of co- podcasts of, of experts around the world. So how are you? How's it going? It's good. We're um, slowly growing our sustainable fashion um, workshop, I would say. Um, we're, we've moved from a 300 square feet like studio where we were like exploding with, you know, stuff that people had to abandon, like textile, old clothing. So finally, I decided to make this leap, um, moving to a new space um, that's like five times bigger. So now we have actually space to work with this um, upcycling. So we have um, a colleague with a baby. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Don't worry. Thanks yeah. for that. So, look, I, I just went through all your biographies and all your experience. And it was fantastic, man. So, you know, like um, moving to the UK, so you did St. Martin's, right? Correct, yes. Uh, and then just come back to Hong Kong and you start your career as an artist, as a fashion designer. That was fantastic. So what you up to now? Because I know you're always in a lot of... a you know, projects and creating new things. It's like a non-stop. Yeah. yeah, I mean, from St. Martin's and then Royal College, I think moving back, I spent 10 years, you know, working on the crazy storytelling fashion label with my brother for 10 years. And then kind of towards the end, I mean, we were doing actually pretty well, selling internationally. We had our Japanese and Korean agents, got different kind of awards from Italy, Hong Kong. Um, yeah, like just living our dream really. And then in 20, well, I don't know how to continue the story. It's like um, not getting emotional or anything, but then at 2014, my boyfriend at that time died acute, died from acute leukemia suddenly in three days. And he was actually the guy who kind of created together with us. Um, built the first, second, and third shop for us. So kind of world crumbled and had a lot of rethinking. Um, And also like my brother left the brand to pursue his music career. So I was just like left alone and thinking like, why are we working so hard on, you know, like keeping this, um, like I was on a hamster wheel, like every year we were creating even though it's just two collections, it was just like a lot of work, a lot of stress to have to find enough business to sustain the team. So I kind of decided to stop the brand in 2015, closed all the studio shops, and I spent one year in like a heavenly Copenhagen. So this uh, Scandinavian um, way of living really inspired me like slow living and just being with a lot of creative people who actually really cared about the environment and the people who are actually working behind the fashion industry so kind of had a lot of intense conversation did a lot of um, research which I did not do when I was in the fashion system so Mm -hmm. found out a lot about you know the people farming the cotton are actually like Every 30 minutes, one cotton farmer shows himself um, taking this, uh, taking, what do you call it? Yeah, anyway, just, and just like lots of harsh facts, like um, factory workers, you know, dying from uh, Rana Plaza and not just that, but just like getting all kinds of skin diseases from the toxic dyes we are using. Um, Just like lots and lots of problems within the fashion industry that I was part of, like a big part of so um yeah so that's that's where I decided you know I needed to change and um just being a fashion designer I do love fashion like so I thought what can I do um to change this fashion system we have which is very kind of sick 
So I think from there, um, the concept of fashion clinic came about because we feel like, um, why is it a clinic? Because we're starting small, like introducing small changes to the way fashion can be created, like encouraging individuals to you know, repair, reshape and redesign clothing that they already have. Like we don't really need to consume so much every year. Um, we only have one body, <laughs> there's seven days in a week. We don't really need to keep changing outfits every day, different times of the day. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's where we created this clinic since 2018. Um, so this is where you are now? This is where, this you is are where I am now. This is this fashion, is, um, clinic. fashion clinic. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. So, and how you met your partner, like your co-founder of Fashion Clinic? How did you guys met? I think we met at at a book exchange, um, also one of the circular economy type activities in Hong Kong. So I initiated this um, secondhand book exchange birthday party or something like that, and then Toby joined me at that time. But then, I mean, so it's um, it's been five years down the road we're working separately now so um i'm more working on um b2b like as in i'm working less with individuals but more with um corporates and brands and the education side of things and i think she's working on more like community um projects so we're working separately now fantastic are we gonna get back to the fashion clinic <laughs> Sure. But, you know, like one, um, when I was lo looking at your biography and your experience, yeah. I just, I'm just going to quote you because I found this fascinating. You say, I've always felt that Hong Kong has no place for dreamers. Our society <laughs> imposes what's right or wrong. This is frustrated for creatives. We prove a heaven for daydreamers. Right? Yeah. This so is that's, where everything uh, started. That's true. That's true. That's um, when I first started coming back to Hong Kong. That's like a big frustration I felt. But it's not even just then. Like, even in my high school days, um, we have a public exam, and I took um, art as one of the subjects. And I was given them, uh, they failed me, basically. And I went in ch to check the grade like how can I fail art class and I, I know that I'm not bad at it so that's kind of like a death sentence right for you know anyone who wants to pursue a creative career like no you fail you failed art and at that point I just felt like oh this city is so I don't know like there's just really no space for someone um creative because I I remember clearly that I was doing a human portrait for the exam and I did it in a blue monotone and I think that's why they failed me but like okay they can't even accept blue monotone human portrait <laughs> wow. it's somehow um yeah like looking back I still think it's it's yeah outrageous like how can how can you fail someone for doing a blue monotone just um yeah, so from there I went to London where, you know, everything and anything goes and just meeting all these crazy people, you can, um, yeah, you can, it just seems like there's no boundary. <laughs> and that's also kind of where me and my brother, you know, um, I guess the creative seats were sold more or less in London. So when we came back, also just, you know, wearing a hat people would look at you like you're a weird you're a weirdo <laughs> um wow so yeah that's that's kind of where it started and we felt we wanted to call our brand dating nation because we felt there's no space no, no place for um crazy people like us so apart from doing our own brand when we had our shop we brought together all kind of like crazy people in Hong Kong. Like we were doing exhibitions every week <laughs> and doing workshops. And in the shop we had 
um, yeah, it was a really fun 10 years, actually. So, can you tell me a little bit of your childhood and why you were so interested about fashion and art? Mm. Because I was wondering how he's growing up, you know, like someone as free that you seem as you, you know, growing up in this kind of cultural, you know, more conservative, if you wish, society. Yeah. So how was it? <laughs> I grew up in a, one of the best girls' schools in Hong Kong, which wasn't actually that suitable for me. Um, so I was very disciplined in studying and I worked really hard. I was a sportsman, um, like a hardcore athlete, wow. like um, running. What did you practice? Um, middle distance, like 400 meters, 800 meters. And I did five kilometers and some semi middle distance running and badminton. So it was a very rigid and disciplined high school life I had. I, But then I had a very creative dad. So my dad worked in the advertisement um, area of things. So he was a creative and he would always bring us to any kind of musical or theater performance that came into town. He would bring us to exhibitions. He also loved fashion. So I think that that was where it all came from. And I guess, yeah, I mean, I think it all, like this creative part of me kind of slowly grew. And because of the public exams that I didn't really agree with, um, I decided, you know, when I was like 17, 18, like it's really not the place to do my university in. So I decided I'm going to London. <laughs> wow. So, but this is really cool because that means your parents support you. They support you to go somewhere else and go study overseas. Yeah. And I'm very, you know, interested in this combination in between being a, uh, you know, very disciplined because of sports yeah. and then being creative, you know. So you, you are this kind of mix in between like being disciplined, you know, decisive yeah. and yes, a bit, yes. you know, a bit competitive, yeah. you know, being competitive, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think that's that kind of came from my parents. I think they're both super intelligent people, but they also worked super hard my mom's a doctor um yeah so i think that the genes kind of came from them and and i'm very grateful that they're actually very liberal people who supported me to go creative um yeah uh, so that i think that's that's very good and i think actually this being disciplined and this hard work like thing that maybe grew from my athlete years or because of my high school like everything has to be perfect everyone worked really hard I think that kind of helped um, bring me to where I am today how we build our brand because I think you know, being creative is one thing but you really have to work super hard I mean I worked super hard when I was in London in school because I think it was wasn't just about working hard at that time it was just like everything was new like you're like a sponge um absorbing all the the juices and um inspirations and from all different kinds of fields like having the best you know um exhibitions and museums to look at the, the world-class designers so i think i think at that time it was like whoa just trying to absorb everything um And when we had the chance to actually start our brand, lucky enough to have some investment, well, we worked 24-7. Yeah. And I think in our in our 20s, we were, you know, like we're creating one collection every six months, but then my brother would turn it into an actual theater performance um, with 50 people, like creating original music, um, you know, and actually staging something that, is a yeah a theater show so i think in six months we would do a theater show and then yeah it's just like all 
So I think I think the balance between being passionate, creative, and disciplined is very important. Of course, of course. And you know, like um, I presume for you, it would be really you know different because as you put it. London is super multicultural, you know, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. lot of things going on, you know, you've got this kind of bunch of eccentric people, like super creative yeah. people. So was yeah. it like a super big change for you, culturally speaking? Because coming from a more conservative society and then going there to London, is a, it seems like a big change, right? Like these kind yeah, of yeah, crazy yeah. parties, you know, because, <laughs> London is really cool. I mean, like I spent uh, about 15 years and it's amazing. It wow. kind of, you know, yeah. if it, it, it takes you, right? Yeah. So was it a big, a big change for you? It, it was quite a big change. I think because at the beginning I didn't drink. So I, I think I skipped a lot of the pub culture in my first four years in London. So I think it was more towards the end that I started kind of um, eased up a bit. And I was like, oh, beer is actually quite nice. And then <laughs> that's when I really actually started socializing with people. I feel like in my first years, I was like so shocked by everything. I was more like in hiding and just <laughs> doing my own work and going to things by myself. But then, yeah, once I, you know, once that all started, I think a lot of my uh, friendships with people who are still living in London started towards the end or maybe after, even after we started the brand because we would go to London, Paris every season to you know, do the trade shows. And yeah, I guess at that point I was maybe more confident um, just chatting to people. And yeah, so, so a lot of my friends actually were my, my friendships were developed from the daydream nation days I feel. that's amazing because you know what one of the things that I found fascinating was this kind of like very cool and you know beautiful and warm relationship with your brother right when you yeah. found it daydream nation that's amazing I mean and by the way I I, I was listening the the music of your brother, and it's really cool, actually. Like, he's a really good musician. It's, it's musician. very cool. So, yeah. how you know how two brothers, well, how two siblings, start this amazing project, the Daydream Nation? So, mm. how how do you, how did I mean, it you were about? talking to? Yeah. So I, the the very beginning of of it was when I was still studying. Um, so I worked for this amazing designer called Jessica Ogden. And um, I think it was from there that I, you know, internships would like really show you how an independent label is run. And I think she was so generous in just, you know, letting us know about all parts of the business. Um, so I think at that time I was thinking, oh my God, if this is what I can do one day, that would be so amazing. So I started doing collections. Um, I really had to fight with my tutors because I studied textiles and they were like, you should just focus on making the fabric. Don't, don't waste your time trying to make clothes. You don't know how to make it. Like you don't know how to sew, you don't know how to pattern cut, but I was very stubborn. I, when I make a piece of fabric, I need it to become a garment. So. So yes, yeah, so I just kind of like forced my way through. Like I fought with my tutors in St. Martin's. I fought with my tutors in Royal College. No one supported the idea that I should become a fashion designer. Um, but that was kind of how I created my graduate collection at Royal College. Um, and I didn't actually think anything about really creating the brand until one day a Japanese person called me up before I came back to Hong Kong after the graduation. Right? And it was like, she was like, hello, um, I am, I can't remember her name, Yuko or something, Yuko, um, I saw your collection at the, your graduate uh, show, um, so I have a buyer who wants to see your work now, I was like, huh, now, it's okay, I was sleeping in late, like, 
like 10 a.m. She asked me to go out to show her my collection. I was like, mm, I don't even know. I was like, okay, okay. Then I just kind of like packed a suitcase of quotes that I made for myself, some for my graduate collection. And then I was suddenly meeting this buyer from Japan in, I think, a Starbucks or some kind of coffee shop in Brick Lane. And that turned out to be buyer from uh, United Arrows, which is a really good select shop from Japan. And he was like, oh, I really like your collection. Like, So he was like, oh, we need to make an order. So I was like, huh, how? And then like, they were like, oh, we need to meet in a more serious place. So I was like, okay. And then, so, so like a few hours later, they came to my home which I kind of like shoved everything into the storage and then kind of made it look like it was a showroom. And I just kind of like mocked up a line sheet where I had all the drawings of every style and then just gave them a pricing. So that was how my first business came about. Like they ordered 150 pieces. Wow. wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. So that was a week before I moved back to Hong Kong where I wow. actually had a, had a job working in a very boring jeans company. Um, so so my day job would be to go back and do some designs. And then in the evenings, I would go home and do the production for this Japanese guy. <laughs> so that was how it started. And I felt like, okay, if there's one buyer who wants to buy what I, <clears throat> what I make, then there will be other buyers who want to buy what I make. So then my brother graduated and I was like, hey, let's let's try to do it together. And then, yeah, and then so we kind of started from there, just creating the whole branding, um, calling it Daily Nation, creating the logo, and then started just creating collections. And then for him, it's like, oh, that's really cool. Like if fashion meets theater can be something we work on, then he can, you know, pursue his or, or make use of his um, set design talent, um, theater directing talent where he, you know, he studied set design and theater, theater directing. So yeah, it just kind of came together really well. And he's also very good at teaching himself um, different things like pattern cutting and sewing. He started from zero. He was like completely self-taught. Um, so it was just like, he's the more crazy person and I'm more the making things happen person. Oh wow. Uh, so have you have you guys been always so close? Even yeah, when you were growing yeah. up? We were we grew up I think maybe we fought a lot until we were like 14, 15 and then just decided <laughs> to make peace and realize <laughs> we have so much in common. Yeah. So our London days were spent together. So I went one year before him, and then, you know, I'll, yeah, we lived together there, even when we were in London. And then when we came back to Hong Kong, we lived together again until recently. But I got married, and then he got married, so. Okay, so a new life then. So, because you guys, the Daydream Nation, it was like for 10 years, am I right? Yes, yes. So. Oh so what do you fun. guys stop it? Because it looked really interesting and sorry, what did we what what do you guys stop the project? Or is it still running? The... No, it's it's not running anymore. Um because I think midway into the brand, um one day when we were doing a fashion shoot, the photographer was going to like after the photographer photographed us he went to shoot another, a singer, like a, a singer, like a celebrity. And he had a very cool indie music label. So actually Jing and I tagged along to the, that photo shoot because he was doing the photo shoot with his guitar anyway. So we kind of like just followed along. So Jing, like, whilst or after they did that photo shoot with the celebrity Anthony Wong, Jing went up, like Anthony was like very suspicious, like what are these people doing at my photo shoot? <laughs> and then and then Jing was just like singing a little bit, singing his songs with the guitar. Um, so we caught his attention and then he's like, what are you guys doing? Who are you? 
And then Jake was went up and said, um, "Can you give me three minutes? I would like to sing you a song." And that's where he yeah convinced Anthony um, that he is good. So Anthony actually signed him into their label called People Mountain PPC. Wow! So that's um, yeah another kind of like legendary story where that's that's when he you know kind of decided oh i really want to pursue my singer songwriting career and i was like yeah go so you know that's where he left like he left gradually um he would work three days a week and then like two days a week and then maybe one day a week so wow. okay. yeah yeah so, so he kind of left gradually and i was left to you know run the business um, yeah, and it wasn't so fun without him. I know. So was he hard for you when he left? Uh, yes and no, because we also had a really cool team. Um, but it was also the stress from running, you know, a wholesale business where we would sell our collections overseas, which is a very fun thing to do, like going to all these like Paris, London, Milan, uh, meeting friends, meeting buyers. But then I also had our shops in Hong Kong, like one, two, three, three shops. Um, yeah, and but but it, I think it was like a gradual impact from fast fashion that yeah. people, you know, the the yeah. I think it was great the first I think six seven years when we did the our brand, but it just slowly went downhill and it definitely had to be fast fashion that was impacting because a lot of independent brands gradually closed down yeah. because you know fast fashion offered 52 collections a year wow. and you know at what like you can get a pair of jeans for five pounds um it's just ridiculous and that's all because they're not really paying anyone properly and that's why you know the factory workers are you know being killed in 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 these like uh factory collapses um and just like lots of horrible things happening to them um and not having enough money to even buy medicine or go to the hospital you know these people in bangladesh or i don't know vietnam india um so yeah i think i felt or, I mean, maybe in hindsight, looking back, I feel it was the impact of the fashion industry, um, or the fast fashion, um, that made it more difficult to sell. So, yeah, I feel like we were moving away from being truly creative. Like, we were, we ha we were kind of pushed into or being forced to become more commercial. Um, my Korean buyer would say to me, like, she would suddenly send me a box of samples from different brands. And she's like, okay, you should study these uh, samples, kind of hinting or saying, like, maybe you can consider, you know, copying these styles because these were popular. And that's just not the way we work. Like, at that point, I was just like, okay, no, I, I don't think I can continue doing this if our agent would be pushing us to try to, like, she loved our branding, loved our logo, loved our style, but then she felt our sales was not doing um, good enough, right? So she would find ways to just like, okay, you can copy this, you can copy that, and this will sell, that will sell, and that's just not working for us so I think that's one of like the major reasons I decided to you know just call it quits like stop wow because you know like I've read in your storyline mm -hmm. that this kind of 2014 was kind of a sort of a turning point when you moved to Denmark right and you yes, were exposed yes. to this kind of sustainable scene you know mm -hmm. And of course, you know, historically, the, the you know, the, the Nordic people yes. are, you know, very close to nature. They always try to, this kind, they, they have this kind of sort of biocentric, right, society because they do, even though the weather can be really tough, they go mm. out and trek and, you yes. know, they have these beautiful sceneries. 
So what you found so interesting the sustainable is in that what struck you? Um, I guess actually you were mentioning cultural shock um, earlier when I went to London. I think whoa, going to Copenhagen was the biggest cultural shock I had <laughs> wow. because Hong Kong is such a fast-paced society and um, we live in small houses but people are like <laughs> there's a lot of stress for people um, working and they would call this what retail therapy like they would go shopping and buy stuff to feel better so i think it's just like super ironic that we live in tiny shoebox houses people buying loads of shit and having no space to sleep like because their our homes are just like cluttered with too much stuff that we buy that we probably don't need right so then <laughs> suddenly i'm in Copenhagen uh, everything's like suddenly super calm um, I arrived on I think Christmas Day everything was closed yeah so like uh, everyone bikes and I love cycling I was so happy like cycling instead of having to take any public transportation like so everything's just suddenly like you c it seems like you can control everything but everything is slowed down and everyone like in Hong Kong as well, like this convenience thing because everyone's like working crazy long hours. So it's just like so convenient to just buy, eat out or buy takeout. But in Copenhagen, no, this doesn't happen. Like everyone is, um, yeah, they buy, like in the studio that I worked, I had to go buy grocery and cook lunch for everyone. And I mean, that's just such a great way to, you know, get to know the people in the studio, have a chat, we would cook lunch together. Like we were teamed up with different people to go buy the grocery together on our bikes and um, cook together and we would have lunch beside the lake with a lot of swans, you know, it's just suddenly a big change of scenery. And everyone had very minimal homes. They would have just like, one very nice sofa, one very nice dining room, maybe a rug, and that's it. Like, they have no belongings, like, not much. Just, But, you know, in Hong Kong, it's just like every home you go to, it's like all the walls are filled with uh, shelves, and the shelves are filled with stuff, like, just stuff, stuff, stuff. But in Copenhagen, you're like, oh, suddenly, like, you can have so much space and you can feel so calm without all this stuff that clutters up your life and um so i think one one like really interesting incident is when i invited my friends over and i cooked for them i cooked the hong kong movie which is like you know like normally for a family to have dinner you would make a soup you would have two to three dishes and then rice so my friends some from copenhagen some from france some from Belgium, they came over and they were like, Kay, why have you cooked so much stuff? <laughs> so even, you know, food wise, they are, even food wise, they are very minimal. Like even a household of like four or five people, they would just like bake one lasagna and that's dinner, right? And I was like cooking a feast, but that's, you know, the way, I don't know, Chinese people, like we love eating and I thought it was the way to, you know, treat my friends. Like we had seafood and they were thinking like, this is too much. You are <laughs> crazy. And at that point, that was, yeah, you know, very impactful because, yeah, like in all, all ways of life, all parts of life, eating, um, clothing, you know, furniture, interiors, even transport, just bike, like everything is so simple and you have to, everything you have to do for yourself but i guess we're, we're pretty spoiled in hong kong like everything's very convenient um something breaks you go find the i don't know the carpenter guy to come fix it for you but in copenhagen everyone does everything themselves wow. like they seem to everyone seem to have all the skills you need to i don't know survive without anyone else and i learned a lot from different friends yeah yeah, yeah. Actually, like you, this is this guy. 
that you were working with, right? He's yeah. like um, Henrik. Henrik, yes. Vipskov, right? Yes, yes, yes. The so coolest how, fashion designer in Copenhagen. Yeah. So how did you meet with him? How was the? Uh, well, it was. I think I was just fortunate enough to win this Young Design Talent Award that gave me the chance to get the scholarship money so I could go anywhere in the world to work for anyone I want to. Um, so I picked Henrik because he also had a very strong kind of fashion theater linkage. So every season he would also do some crazy theater-ish show, fashion show. Um, so I went there and worked in this more, more the set theater department where every, like, the catwalk, crazy catwalk stuff. Um, Yes, I don't. I didn't really meet him until I went to Copenhagen. Um, I had a friend who worked for him before, so that's kind of the, the linkage. So, and yeah. then he was, so then he was into sustainable fashion, right? I think he is today like much more into sustainable fashion. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think he he changed and developed a lot since twenty sixteen. Yeah. You know, like, hey, I, I've seen you have a lot of awards, you know, since you were so young. That's why you moved to Copenhagen, because you you won this Young Design Talent Award yes. in, in 2015, right? But before, you have yes. the Vogue Talent, yes, the yes, Outstanding right. Design Award, yes. uh, the Talent 40 and the 40 Design Award. Wow, you know everything. The Wide Award. Dude, it's amazing, but I was wondering how do you keep um, yourself on earth, on the ground? Because, you know, I mean, people change, you know, when you yeah. become popular and you're doing well. You know, there is kind of this tendency of well, change a little bit, be, be a bit more snobby and then, <laughs> you know, perhaps this kind of get into your head. So into your head right so how do you keep like so humble and you know working for your community and you know this kind of like lifestyle that you respect um you know your profession and you are really good at it but also like uh you mm. know committing to to the society in a way that you try to make it different right yeah i don't know i mean well, I think I think at the height of this popularity or fame thing, um, you know, I, I would sometimes be hanging out with more like famous people, like celebrity style. I really hate it. I really hate it. Like people are so fake um, and they only talk to you because of who you are or who you represent or who, you know. And I, yeah, I've never really been a fan of these um social situations or that kind of crowd so actually i think i was so much happier since you know stopping the brand going to copenhagen where i'm you know the people i meet there are all super amazing but even you know the most famous of people like henrik they're also so down to earth um mm. yeah i yeah, I, I prefer a more human approach. And I think there's so much room to life. So, I mean, yeah. yeah <laughs> Even though, yeah, you talking about this because I just went to a friend's birthday on the weekend. And it's exactly this kind of crowd. And, oh, my God. Uh, yeah, I, I left halfway. <laughs> because I, I just couldn't stand these kind of, you know, people who think they're famous, think they are somebody um, yeah, this this attitude thing is just like I can't stand. Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Anyway. So, K yeah. hey, is on a mission to create zero waste art and design. So, yes. Can you explain to our audience a little bit the concept of fast fashion and upcycling? Mm. Okay, so basically from my Copenhagen days, I think I want to start with my journey because I decided it is just seeing so much waste in the industry, like so much problems with 
the factory workers and cotton farmers and all that, um, I decided, oh God, this industry is so sick. Like I need to take a break. So I did a one year of not buying any new clothes. So people were like, oh my God, why are you not buying any new clothes? You're a fashion designer. Um, so I blogged about it. Like, okay, even if you don't buy new clothes, there's way too much. You can, I don't know, do clothes swapping. You can uh, thrift. You just There's so many nice vintage or secondhand stores around. Um, just do more what do you call it? Uh, mix and matching with your own outfits. You know, like re redesign what you have, right? So there's so much... So I think that's my starting point. And then it also just made me think as a fashion designer or designer, um, our mission is really to, I don't know, not just to reduce waste, but to design with what is left over or abandoned. Because like, <sighs> there's so much textile or fashion waste or not just even fashion or textile, but you know, even from fast furniture or fast products, like things are going to the landfill at a speed that is just so not acceptable. So I decided, okay, I want to, I don't want to use any new virgin material. So that was the rule I set for myself, like no more new material. I only want to work with what people are throwing out because even, even if you work with only what people throw out, there's so much um, pre-consumer even before you buy a product, so much is already thrown out right? in the in the production in the factory. Like you're cutting a T-shirt, and what what happens to what you cut, right? It just goes, you know, thrown out. So even before, and sometimes in production, like any shit that happens, like leakage of some oil or some paint, or the print is not printed well, that becomes trash. Right. So from pre-consumer to post-consumer is like when you buy the clothes and then after you wear it maybe a few times, you're tired of it, you throw it out. Yeah, so that's just like so much waste. So I decided, you know, not to. So that's that's how I define what I do now is designing from waste, designing from abandoned surplus or damaged textiles. Yeah. So... um Right, exactly, and, and also like uh, you know, like the clothing industry or the fashion industry is one of the most polluting industries in the world. Am I right? It's crazy. Yes. So you know, yeah. initiative like yours, you know, sustainable fashion is so important. I I have the impression that people have no idea how important it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? One of the things that I like about your story is, you know, defining yourself as a green art artist. Artivist. Right? I love <laughs> yes. that concept. Yeah. You know. Um, so, yeah. what exactly does a green artivist do? <laughs> so basically, again, just not using any virgin material. Um, but I still still felt like I was, you know, had this creative urge to, you know, keep on creating. So the first series of artwork I did in Copenhagen, um, I, you know, just inspired by that city. Like there were so many swans in the lake um, and they would have so much feathers fall out. So I would, um, yeah, I guess I was just like, I had so much more free time when I was in Denmark. So I would go around like, oh, my God, the, these feathers are so nice. So I scoop it up from the lakes or just pick it up from the uh, from the parks. And, yeah, I went home and, you know, cleaned it, boiled it. And then was like, oh, I want to create some textile work with it. So so that was my first series of artwork because I think I found some, like, old picture frames and then, like, some yarns that my friends were throwing out. So I feel like, okay, three things. Um, and then I started weaving these uh, swan feathers and then like doing some woodwork, like carving these old picture frames. And that was like my first series of work, like 30, um, tw 20 frames with these swan feathers and I called it fight or flight. Yeah, it's just like a different way of, you know, just this green 
archivist that's like exploring new ways of creating um, from trash, really. Um, yeah, so that, that was that's, the uh, That's, that's fantastic. I, I really like the concept. I'm actually going to dig a little bit into it. But so do you coin it or you have you heard about this? I mean, I'm sorry. Do I did you did you actually coin the term, or did I coined the term? Oh, which yeah. means you? Oh wow! I I yeah. love the term. So did you? I mean, did you make it up or not really? I Artemis. made it. Up. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Wow! You seem like you even creating this thing. That's amazing. Because I did. I I felt like activist is is too strong a word because I'm not. If I, I put art instead of the activist, it sounds more, I don't know, calm, but there's friendly. action. Friendly, yes, friendly, friendly or, right? Yeah. Wow, I love it. So listen, so we're talking about fashion clinic, right? Mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit what fashion clinic is and, you know, how do you guys sustain yourself financially and then what? your impact in terms yeah. of, you know, this kind of sustainable ecosystem? Yeah. So, I mean, we call ourselves fashion doctors or fashion surgeons. So we mm. try to resuscitate dead stock um, fabric or garments um, to keep these kind of textile waste from the landfills, just giving it a new life, um, trying to... Um, kind of change the system, fashion system um, from a linear take, make, uh, wear, and then dump to the landfill. Instead of like a linear line, we try to make it circular. So we try to say we're trying to change design in order to design change. Like that's my mission, like really, because I think if we don't, if we don't change the way we design, like, yeah, there's no way we can, you know, design an actual change in in the industry. So that's kind of like the mission, the idea of our mission and concept. So we started off, um, so we've got maybe four areas that we work on. So we started off working for individuals, like repairing, redesigning old clothing. But that's very tough because um, we're also competing with fast fashion. So people's concept is they can buy a pair of jeans for five pounds. But if I have to repair it for you, how much are you willing to pay? Right. So I think the first first, second year we did a lot of that, but it was really tough financially. So we actually did a lot of um, education stuff like giving talks and workshops where people are maybe more generous to pay for your service. So I think that that was actually pretty good income before COVID. So um, yeah, we did talks, a lot of talks, a lot of workshops, and we cu curated a 10-day sustainable fashion festival at the mills um, wow. with the help of a bank. Um, kind of sponsoring us so that was amazing because we brought together you know 30 plus designers from around the world to showcase what sustainable fashion or upcycling can be about wow. because um yeah i think there's a lot of stigma um towards upcycling like people always think upcycling is something that's that looks cheap or um mm. it's, it's you know like there's, there's a certain kind of way people look at upcycling but we're constantly trying to redefine it because i mean the the people i see in london in europe and in, in the netherlands working on upcycling they do it so good it's even mm. better than not upcycled stuff i feel so yeah so that was the festival but then COVID hit so i i gradually kind of um understood that we need to work with brands or corporates because they have the money and they should be paying for this change in our industry. So yeah, we started approaching different kind of brands from you know Japan and um, re more recently we worked with Calvin Klein and Adidas on bigger projects. Actually, you know, 
uh, redesigning like 3,000 pair of jeans, making new capsule collection with what they have left over, creating window display, in-store, customer engagement activities, um, workshops. Um, so yeah, I think we've slowly shifted from the individuals um, and the education sections to more working in a bigger scale. And that's mm -hmm. how it works um, financially now, I think. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's really good work, though. And do you think it's popular in Hong Kong to upcycle or, or be produced going to the fast fashion? It's really not popular to upcycle in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. okay. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's just the mentality of people liking new stuff. It's a, a very Chinese uh, way of thinking. Like right? uh -huh. in the new year, in the new year, you need new clothes to look. Um, presentable, you should be wearing something that looks, you know, new. People like the newness of things. So it's a very tricky, tricky thing to change within our culture. But then I think there are a lot of more like, international brands that are willing to step up um, and do something that's more uh, bold. Like, I think the Calvin Klein project was really good. I think they were actually out there to make the statement like we are redesigning from you know our dead stock inventory um so that's yeah, really but cool. I mean, that's yeah, amazing I like, I like, and also yeah. and also i really like the fact that you guys are making partnerships with let's say more orthodox sort of kind of business right like um yes. business as yeah. usual we, it's very important, you know, it's not like we're enemies, it's just we need to like make these partnerships in order to, you know, kind of scale up the work that people in our sector are doing, right? Which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's, I'm very strategic, no? At the end of the day, hey, we need to survive financially, otherwise yeah. we cannot go forward, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, like I read that um, at the JCIA Sustainable yeah. Fashion Conference. Yes. You delivered a speech called Confessions of a Fashion Insider. So <laughs> I was wondering, what did you confess? Uh, I think it's pretty much what I just told you just now, like yeah. my journey okay. of how, you know, I, I worked as a fashion designer and just, you know, this Scandinavian exploration, self-exploration, I, I realized, you know, how, how damaging the industry is, as well as how, I don't know, over-consuming we are as people from Hong Kong or Asia, like, we just love yeah. shopping and people, you know, like all that. And as a fashion designer who's, you know, in this so-called hamster wheel, um, you know, I was actually part of um, initiating more consumption, right? So from that point on, I felt like my confession was like, oh, my God, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Because at that point, I was like an ostrich with my head in the sand, like just not ignoring you know all these problems within the industry and now when i suddenly you know have woken up my confession is i i want to you know change um, or redo what you know i have done wrong <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah of course yeah. of course listen when i reflect on the sustainable ecosystem i always think you know what are the drivers that people, you know, have in order to do this kind of initiative because you like usually create change, create social change, create, uh, you know, kind of collective consciousness. It takes time. Sometimes, you know, financially speaking, it's not worthy. So what are your drivers? So why do you start with this and whether you think it's worthy? Uh, so a lot of people actually ask me why didn't you stay on in Denmark it was like such heaven for you um, mm. but, but because 
it is because there's so much problem in a city like Hong Kong, like, like tiny cities squashed with a lot of people really over consuming, having our landfills, you know, filled up to the top daily. Um, I think this is where the problem really is. And this is home for me. So that's, that's why I picked to come back here to make a, make changes, uh, make a difference because there is so much wrong. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I think that's the reason why I decided to come back. Because if I stayed in, I don't think there's much problem in Denmark <laughs> as much as here. So uh, <laughs> okay, yeah, that's amazing. And I was wondering, like, how how about your parents now? You know, mm. like because for them, I suppose it was a learning process, right? Like. You working in sustainable, you know, fashion design and then upcycling. So how, you know, they are really into it now? Or? Oh, okay. So my, my dad passed away when I was 19. So he didn't get to see okay. any of the daydream nation or whatever. Um, but my mom, she actually, both her and my grandmother are very eco people. I think oh, wow. especially my grandmother, she went through the second world war, right? So like she went through like really tough times when there's like yeah. no water, no electricity. So she's a person who, you know, is a manifestation of, you know, being super eco, but that's not just out of, I mean, of course she cares about the environment too, but it's not because of that, because she's been through days where she's gone without, without water, without electricity, without food. And that's why she's really just, careful when she's using like she would stop me from you know turning on the water tap to wash my hands like I would just turn it on to the biggest right she would like close it so that the water's like <laughs> you know things wow. like that she would she would make her own clothes she would mend her own clothes um she had nice. a wardrobe of I don't know less than 10 pieces of clothing like so so she passed away a few years back, but yeah. she had so little possessions that I was like, oh my goodness. But she always looked super decent as well. So she had a small wardrobe. She really took care of the things that she had. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just their generation that really treasures um, everything that they had. So my mom's the same and she worked for Friends of the Earth since I was young. So actually these kind of seeds of, you know, upcycling and just, you know, it had always been there. So it's not a change for my mom. Yeah. I mean, she, she was, she's super happy that um, I'm doing what I'm doing today. And I'm also working with uh, different kind of NGOs like Friends of the Earth. I've worked with um, Greenpeace, um, WWF, you know, like whenever we can, like we do a lot of just kind of different talks, workshops just spreading this um, upcycling, sustainable fashion. Um, yeah, our concept, what we're doing and what we hope can change in the industry. So, yeah. Um, amazing, amazing. So listen, uh, as a, you know, green entrepreneur, okay, as a green activist, what do you think um, are, the, what, what are the challenges? You know, in this kind of like industry, as an entrepreneur, as a, a sustainable fashion designer, what do you think are the challenges that you most face, or people like they work in the industry face? I think space is one mm -hmm. of the biggest challenges because rent is super high in Hong Kong. So we've been so very lucky that I've um, had a rich lady who gave us a space to use for the last four years, which wow, I moved man. out of. I mean, I paid a little bit. It's not really rent. It's more like management fees for that building. Um, so without that, I don't think I would. we would have survived until now. Like, like, because I didn't really have to pay rent, I could spend what we earned on the people, <laughs> um, our seamstresses. So we have a team of five to six people now. And that's the only way we can work on bigger scale projects. Um, so, yeah, and also with especially 
working with upcycling, a lot of companies or brands, um, like when they throw things out, they have to throw it immediately. So if I don't have the space to take it at that point, it would just go to the landfill, right? But with the space I had before, which was like a shoebox, like I, I cannot take everything all the time. Like I have to be very selective. But sometimes, like if you don't take it at that point, you don't know when you're going to be able to get hold of some nice wool if you want it, right? So that people are throwing out. So it's, I think it's a constant struggle um, space, yeah. like having, having the space to take what people throw out and how much can I take, right? Although I have a bigger space now, like I still cannot say yes to anyone who's throwing anything out because... <laughs> then we'll be running out of space to work again. Yeah, of course. So yeah, okay. so I think I think this is the biggest struggle for me because I also have like so many friends. Like I, I can't even say on social media or anywhere that we take secondhand clothing or textiles because otherwise everyone will be chucking their stuff into our... Like they yeah, don't really, you know, like people don't understand. Yeah, yeah, of yeah, course, yeah. of course, I'm not doing that. Well, yeah. And listen, at, at, you know, at a personal level, you know, Kay, you know, like kind of stepping up from this kind of like professional persona. Do you struggle sometimes? Because you must be really tiring working in an industry which is very profitable. So you are kind of like swimming against the current, right? That's true. So, that's true. So at a personal level, sometimes you <laughs> struggle. So how do you manage to say, okay, yes, it is worth it. Let's keep doing this. <laughs> um, I guess I'm I, I'm at, at a better place now because I teach, you know, and yeah. I'm from you. That gives some more kind of stable um, or an extra stable income for me. So yeah. uh, that's one thing. Um, and it's also very fortunate that our family um, investment wise, like my mom helped me with getting a place that I live in. So I think I'm relatively financially stress-free than a lot of other people, because that's always a problem for people in Hong Kong because rent or you know, buying a place is so expensive. So I feel like I have this kind of backup from my mom. So, yeah, uh, you know, the, what's what's the worst case is like, you know, one day if it doesn't work anymore financially, I'll just have to close it. I mean, that's like the worst case. So, I mean, I'm not I'm not as stressed as uh, some other um, entrepreneurs, I guess. No. So I'm just like giving it all. <laughs> yeah. And that just, which is I amazing. Yeah. Do, uh, I just have to continue being like disciplined, hardworking, giving it like 200%. I feel like that's the only way I can keep going. Um, Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. And thanks for that because without people like you, you know, we just going to create more wastage and, you know, more clothing to, to be, yeah. you know, to be, to be burnt out and, you know, have a bit more the planet. Um, You know, like, Hey, I have two more questions, okay? Mm -hmm. Hey, what tips for people who want to start to work or create new products uh, in fashion uh, would you give based on your experience? What tips would you like share based upon this long journey of, you know, creativity and... Um... I mean, of course, I would encourage people to upcycle with whatever brand they decide to start. And I think some of the design heroes I see um, would include, you know, Freitag from Switzerland, who works only with truck tarps. Um, I think, I mean, because there is so much waste in the world, I think anyone can try to identify a type of waste that inspires them to create something new, to mm -hmm. keep our economy circular. So, I mean, there's so many people doing so many 
cool things. Like there would be like you know a brand from Bangkok called uh, Dry Clean Only, and they only work with uh, secondhand clothing. I think the secondhand clothing market is very vibrant in Thailand, so it's very easy for them to get hold of just specific types of secondhand clothing. So it's like beautiful design, but everything is upcycled. Um, yeah. I just, I just feel like you know everyone should um, start upcycling. You just don't really see or know where you can get this so-called trash from, but it's not really trash. It's actually, you know, material trash. Like it's. Material from this world that we've taken, and it shouldn't really go to the landfill. Yeah, of course, of course. So the last one is, you know, what book or a movie that perhaps inspired you that you'd like to share with us, that you liked to recommend us to watch well, or to read? Yeah, yeah. Well. I mean, for like a starters, starters course for sustainable fashion, or if you want to learn more about what's what's happening behind the fashion industry, would be the True Cost that documentary. Um, okay. Another documentary I really like is Tomorrow. It's done by two French people. Like oh, yeah. Like, oh, of course. Yeah, of I also course. really like Tomorrow. Yeah, just start, you know, thinking about new systems or how you how you design change, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Kay, thank you so much thank for you. Your sharing your story. It's been super inspiring. I hope fingers crossed I can again travel as I used to and maybe I just pop by Hong Kong yes, and say hello please. to you, Toby. Yeah. And also, like, if you happen to be here in Europe, let me know. Yes. And maybe Definitely. we can catch up. Okay. Yay. Thank you, cool. Andre. Thanks, Kate. Right. Take care. Cheers. Goodbye. Bye. Cheers.